So guys, yeah, I'm going to give you an overview, an overview of the acres cooperation. Okay, so if you're interested in general, I will not be covering the general acres tonight. Okay, because they are different. It, it does depend on where your farm is. Is that all right? So uh, a lovely picture here from Kerry, because I'm obviously a Kerry woman, so I couldn't put up a cart photograph then, sorry, to go against everything I believe in. So guys, um, just a bit of a, a background, I suppose. Um, you'll be wondering, who is Patricia Dean? Where does she come from? Well, I am from Kerry. Um, my father's a hill sheep farmer. Going back years ago, we used to actually milk a couple of uh, cows as well, and we used to have a couple of turkeys when they didn't get away from us, so we did everything and anything. But uh, that's what we, what we used to do at home. But I worked for South Kerry Development Partnership, a local development company. Uh, so we tendered to, to the Department of Agriculture to roll out the Acres Cooperation Project. So my background would have been working with the farmers in the McGillicuddy Reeks. And um, our team then, some of the team are here tonight, um, they come from a, a multitude of different backgrounds as well. Some of the guys have come from Farm Advisory, and some of them have come from consultancy where they would have been looking at specific issues like maybe water and things like that. So we'll touch a little bit more on that later on. So South Kerry Development Partnership, you might be familiar here with West Cork Development Partnership. We're the equivalent um, in, in, um, in South Kerry, but we will be covering obviously all of the acres cooperation in Kerry and West Cork. And we're doing that in close cooperation with West Cork Development Company. Because both companies, the focus is the same, local development, we're non-for-profit organisations, and we're focusing on rural and community development. Okay? So that's just a little bit of background, guys. To your saying, we don't care, get to the point. <laughs> so that's just that's what I mentioned, I suppose, a good bit of background there, loads of different background with the team, and that's very important because we wanted everybody coming in to work with you as farmers and farm advisors to be able to understand the issues on the ground. That's really, really important, okay? So guys, I suppose, what do we want to get out of this? Well, this is what we are saying our vision is. We want to work really closely with you, the custodians of the land, with the farmers and the farm advisors, because this is all very, very new. It's a new approach, um, but we want to, to work with you to improve the environmental and agricultural condition of the land in a sustainable manner, okay? So some people have said to me, you don't want farmers farming anymore. That is not true. We need to support farmers to continue farming. The land needs to be managed, okay? So that's very important. We don't want anybody thinking we want to stop at your farming. That's not the case. Okay. So guys, you'll be familiar with this. Um, so this is the eight areas um, that Frank referred to earlier, and there's approximately 5,117 herds here in the uh, West Cork Kerry area, the purple area. Okay. Um, so I'll show you that, how we're going to divide it into sub-regions. But we have said, because it's such a huge area, we wanted a presence in each of those areas. So we've divided it into four sub-regions. So a camp, not too far from the Dingle side of the house. We're there in Dwyer's. Uh, we're in Beaufort Village. Um, so that's close to a, a lot of the sheep farmers there in the McGillicuddy Reeks. Um, we're also going to be in Kinmare to cover a lot of the farmers down around the uh, Ever Peninsula and obviously the Bear Peninsulas. And then, obviously, we have an office here as well in Bentry uh, with West Cork Development Partnership, okay? So there's going to be a number of agri-environmental officers working in each of those offices, and that's to work with the farm advisors, because, again, this is new to a lot of the farm advisors, and to work with the farmers, okay? So there's going to be a lot of kind of cooperation and a lot of support needed to make this work. So uh, I'll talk a little bit more about that, and I suppose what the advisors will be doing and what the... the um, the agri-environmental officers will be doing. Okay, is that fair enough? You're all with me? No one's got off to sleep yet? That's good. <laughs> all right, that's... So, apologies now for the map. But that's roughly how we've broken it into the four regions. And obviously, we won't know exactly how these might change slightly. It will depend on where um, farmers are located that get into the scheme. And as I mentioned already, that is being decided by the Department of Agriculture. We don't have a say in who gets into the scheme or doesn't get into the scheme. That's been done at the Department of Agriculture level. Okay. So, guys, I suppose I've said there in the, in the booklet uh, that we have four objectives or four targets for the scheme. And I added a fifth one, actually, to the presentation when I had a little think about it. Uh, so what do we hope to get out of this? Well, we do want to work to protect water courses, and I don't think there's anyone would object to that, because our water courses are really, really getting into poor condition, and that's something that we can control by carrying out relatively simple measures on the farms. And it's not all farms, guys. I'm not here to, to bash any farmers, okay? There's a lot of 
things that impact on water quality. Farming is one of them, and it's things that we can do to, to prevent that from happening, to get things into better condition. So that's one of our objectives. We're also going to hear a bit about this carbon storage. Carbon storage is really important. We look at peatland areas. Peatland areas, if they're in good condition, store a lot of carbon. So you talk about keeping the carbon in the ground as much as possible. We all hear about carbon dioxide getting into the atmosphere. We don't want that. Nobody wants that. It adds to climate change. We definitely don't want that. Um, so we're just trying to protect those, those landscapes. Um, and we have to try and protect the rare and the, the, the threatened habitats. So what are habitats, guys? You hear about these results-based payments and these habitat payments. A habitat basically is a piece of land where something lives. Does that make sense? Yeah. So that's the easiest way to describe a habitat. So if the land is in good condition, everything then that's on the land should follow suit, that that would be in good condition as well. Okay. So protecting the conservation of rare and threatened species. So when we talk about rare and threatened species, we could be talking about the grouse, we could be talking about the curlew, we could be talking about the freshwater pearl mussel, we could be talking about any of those things. Okay? So there's really startling um, statistics out there at the moment about the decline, we'll say, of farmyard birds. I think they've declined by something like 60%. You know? So this is happening. Again, guys, it's small things that would make a big difference to how we're doing things, and that's what we're going to be here to try and help you do on your farms. Okay? Um, the management of invasive species. This is one very close to my own heart because I spent the last five years trying to knock out rhododendron in and around the McGillicuddy Reeks area. And again, lads, there's a lot of invasive species, and they are taking over. And like, th th once they get in, it's really, really hard to try and knock them back. Okay, so we're going to try and manage them where possible and training. So as I've mentioned, guys, it won't be just training with yourselves, the farmers. We'll also be doing a lot of training with the farm advisors because this whole idea of acres, results-based assessments, it's all very new. Is that fair enough? Yeah. So there is good news, lads. I suppose anything you do, you'll get support to do as well. You won't have to pay for it out of your own back pocket. So if you come to training, if you need training, that will be paid for. Okay. And we think that is very important because we feel very strongly that, yes, you're giving your time. You should get paid for it. Yeah? Okay. So, guys, the main elements. So, I suppose the way this has been structured across the country, not just in the, the, the West Cork Kerry area, there's three main components, okay? There's a results-based payment, right? So, this is the core payment for every participant. And it all depends on the quality, what the land is like, okay? So what is the quality of the land? So there's going to be different scorecards depending on what kind of land you have. Okay? So if you've got a grassy field, it'll be a grassland scorecard that'll be used. If it's a peatland site, a lot of the commonages would be peat, it would be peatland scorecards that would be used. Obviously then, for example, woodlands and scrub would be different. There would be a scorecard, we'll say, for the chuff, and there's coastal grasslands. Coastal grasslands are completely different to other grasslands, okay? So their scorecards being devised, and again, training will be given to the farm advisors on how to use these scorecards. And I'm telling you guys, they're very straightforward, very um, easy to use, and a lot of the farmers that would have been involved in previous schemes, like the Hin Harrier scheme, for example, or the Freshwater Pearl Muscle scheme, the a lot of the farmers would have used the, the cards themselves and would know how they work, okay? But they're devised to be very fair um, to you, the farmer. Okay, so that's a big part of, of the scheme. Um, some farmers, depending then if they have a small area, or area of land, they might have had to take on some general actions. Okay, but I goes th what the reason behind these is it's trying to incentivize improvement. Okay, and I'll show you what I mean by that in a minute. But we're we're trying to reward farmers and incentivize farmers. So if you've got land and it's in really good condition, you'll get the top payment. Maybe if there's small little tweaks that need to be made, we need to incentivize you to make it make it better then you will get a higher payment, okay? So that's the idea behind them, results-based. Um, so it's all to improve the ecological and the environmental condition of the land, okay? So this is where the farm advisor will be coming out to you, okay? So um, if you get selected, you'll be getting a letter from the Department of Agriculture. They will tell you if you have been successful coming into the scheme. Um, and then you will, your farm advisor will be out here during the course of the summer. Okay? So the assessments will probably start, we think, in June. They'll go on June, July, August, possibly into September, I'm not too sure yet, where the farm advisor will walk over every single one of your, your fields and they will do an assessment based on the kind of land you have. Does that make sense? Yeah. Okay. And if you've got commonage land, our team, the cooperation team, will be doing the assessments on the commonages. Okay? 
So we're looking forward to that. <laughs> All right. So that's the way it works, guys. It gets a score. So think of a one to 10, okay? So the higher the score, the higher the payment. The maximum you can get on the results based is 7,000. Nobody can get more than 7,000 on the results based, unless your land is in perfect condition. If your land is in perfect condition, happy days, you'll get a bonus. Does that make sense? Okay. Um, and I talked about the scorecards already. So obviously, guys, the scorecards are very different for a reason. It's because the land is different. Okay, so you could have two no neighboring farms, but they could be completely different. They might look similar, but you know, you could have chuff on one. There might not be chuff next door. All right. So guys, I'm not sure now how well you can make that out, uh, but it's, I think it's in the presentation anyway. I'm not sure actually if it is, but or in the booklet. But basically here, if you get a score of four, you'll get 150 euro per hectare, okay? If you move up to six, you'll get 205 a hectare. If you move up to eight, you'll get 300. And if you get a score of 10, you're getting 400 euro a hectare, okay? So the idea is the higher the score, the higher the payment. And then trying to make you get a higher score or to help you get a higher score, you can take on certain actions. Does that make sense? Okay. So I have here down at the bottom as well, guys, there's a reduced scale for farmers that are going to be in the organic farm scheme, okay? So obviously there can't be double payments, and that's why you'll see there it's scores of four up to a seven don't receive a payment because the, the organics would cover that. Yeah? Okay. So guys, that's for the lowland uh, grassland, and then the common edges is a different rate of payment. So again here, it goes from a payment of 60 a hectare right up to 220 a hectare, okay? And what I've said, guys, when we talk about a results-based assessment, it's about being a fair assessment. We don't want land that's overgrazed. We don't want land that's undergrazed. It's all about balance. Balance, 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 okay? Um, so there is a commonage participation payment then that's going to be paid at 50 euro hectare on the first 20 hectares, and that's um, regardless of your score. So every farmer with a commonage would, would get that payment, okay? Is that fair enough? Yeah? Okay, so guys, the next part of it, so that's the results base, that's the 7,000, that's the big payment. We move on then to these non-productive investments. Don't like this term at all myself, I think it's very wordy. What I prefer to call them are supporting actions. So this is things that you can carry out in your farm to improve your score. So it's the opportunity to increase your habitat payment, okay? So examples might be, guys, you know, you, could be, you, could, you might be losing a little bit on your score, we'll say if there's livestock getting into a water course. So the idea is then that you could go out and purchase some trough, uh, a water trough, and you put that in the right area, and then you're hopefully the following year, the year after, when the land is assessed, your score will have gone up because you have taken care of the issue. It could be the control of invasive species, or it could be maybe installing a buffer area. You know, if you have a water course again, and you want to do a step back, it could be something like that. But they're designed to be practic practical measures. Now, guys, I could have given you a list tonight, but uh, you might get all very excited about what's on the list, and it might not be applicable to your land, okay? So again, when your advisor is out, and when they're doing the walkover across your land, they will be keeping these in mind. I think there's, about a, there's over 100, I think, non-productive investments or supporting actions. So there is basically something for everybody, um, and it should work. But when your advisor is out, they will be keeping these in mind. What maybe is bringing down your score, and how to bring up your score. Does that make sense? Okay, so an example here, guys. There's a stream there running down along, and uh, this farmer put in wild bird cover down the end of the slope. Because at the end of the slope, obviously, you could have some sediment and things like that getting into the water course, or you might have a bit of phosphorus. So the idea is put in the wild bird cover in the right area, and that'll stop anything from getting into the stream. So you're protecting your stream then, okay? And obviously, you're getting paid for putting your wild bird cover as well. So it's, it's a good action. It's a straightforward one. And a lot of these guys, these actions that are there, they're also available in the general. So whether you're general or cooperation, they would be relevant for both. Um, invasive species, like I said, we do an awful lot of work on training up farmers and uh, setting up groups to go out and actually do work on treatment of invasive species. Because it's very hard if you're trying to do it by yourself. You'd get very browned off it very quickly if you're trying to do a stem treatment on a big area of rhododendron, for example. It's hard work, but it's not impossible. Um, so the, the idea is, you know, you, you try and set up uh, as many people with the skills to deal with the issue as possible, okay? So they're the non-productive investments. The next main element then, guys, these are larger scale things, they're called landscape actions. Um, so between the supporting actions of the non-productive investments and the landscape actions, 
that's where the extra three and a half thousand euro comes in. Okay, so that's what makes up the total payment of the ten and a half thousand. So these are higher level actions. Okay, so these might be actions that would be carried across a comrade, for example, because a comrade wouldn't be in control of just one person. So that might be bringing multiple farmers together to find out what are the issues on the commonage and what are the solutions. Okay, so maybe bringing the commonage shareholders together to work out solutions to the problems. Um, it could be peatland restoration, it could be grazing management, um, it could be flood prevention. Every area, guys, as I said, is different. But um, they would be larger scale things and that would probably be done by the cooperation team ourselves. Okay, so for example, um, this is some photographs from our own EIP project. We would have um, trialled these in the Migalakuri Reeks because we figured if they worked in the Reeks, they'd probably work anywhere. So we used no fence collars. And this is another non-productive investment option that's there. So instead of trying to fence a large area and trying to keep the livestock enclosed in a large area and trying moving fencing around so you don't get overgrazing, we put collars on the cattle and it was all done through your phone. You could draw a line on your phone and you could make sure that the cattle would stay exactly there and if they tried to get out, they'd get a little bit of electric shock. They worked fantastically well, except for one very bold cow who continuously broke out on a Saturday and Sunday morning, and I did not appreciate being woken by that cow. But anyway, so pros and cons to it, guys, but they worked very well. And again, like we put the cattle on the mountain because there were some areas of the mountain where the fanon, I don't know what you call it in Cork, we call it fanon and carry purple moorgrass or millennia, it was taking over. The sheep will only eat it for a very short period of time. So we put the cattle in there to graze it down instead. And it worked really, really well. Okay? So the next two photographs I have there, I mean, if I showed you the first gra photograph, it's not a great quality photograph now, but that would have been very bare ground. Okay? So what we did, we did a stock exposure, and the farmer agreed to doing it. No livestock in there at all for a period of 12 months. And then you can see the improvement after about 12 months. It makes sense if the ground is too bare, it's no good to anyone. You know, you just have a lot of erosion, you'd have a lot of sediment coming off it and things like that. So after a bit of a break, the vegetation had an opportunity to come back. Does that make sense? Okay. So these are different options that will be available to you. So there's a target of 20,000 farmers uh, for the cooperation. The maximum payment, now this is the results-based payment and carrying out supporting actions or the landscape um, is 52,500 um, over the five-year contract, or else 10,500 annually, okay? Um, so that's it. There may be a bonus. If you're getting a 10 out of 10, you would be entitled to a bonus on top of your 7,000 for the results-based. And then there's the extra 3,500 for these uh, non-productive investment supporting actions or landscape. You can apply for them every year, okay? So if you had a major issue and you say, I want to do loads of work, Trish, because I want to get rid of this, I want to front load my payment, you can do that as well, okay? But you, you really have to be talking to your advisor an awful lot just to make sure that the right action is being carried out in the right place, okay? Um, so again, guys, I've talked about training and we would have done a lot of training because again, this is very, very new to everybody, this whole approach. So between pesticide training, chainsaw training, habitat assessment training, we intend on doing a lot of this training as well with yourselves if you want it, obviously. We won't force anybody to come to training. It's entirely voluntary, okay? So guys, I suppose things to avoid. Um, the big thing, and I'm gonna say it a thousand times, is to really talk to your advisor. Talk to your advisor, think about what's on your land. A lot of you probably have an idea of things that could be improved already, okay? Um, so it really is important to make sure that your advisor is aware of those as well. So if, if you come up with something and you talk to your advisor and your advisor does the walkover during the summer and says, yeah, I think we should do that, um, you, they'll put it up on the system, the IT system um, for the department. It'll come over to us then and we'll have to have a look at it and assess it and make sure that it's okay to go ahead with it. Because what we don't want happening is somebody carrying out work in the wrong place because that could have really negative consequences. So an example of that maybe would you say like, oh, I want to get rid of all the bracken that's there. But if it was really close to a water course, it could be the same with rushes, that you, you could go the other way with it. You know, you, you might have unintended consequences, maybe like some herbicide getting into water course, and we couldn't have that, okay? Does that make sense, guys? Yeah? So um, that's the idea, um, and we'll then compile an annual works plan, um, and obviously then it'll be sent out yourself. So once you receive the plan, you'd be able to rock on and do your work. Um, but I suppose it's important to note that if you want to do work um, now, 
you won't get paid for the work now. You need to get approval before you do it. All right? Um, so, and obviously, guys, everything we do um, and everything that the, yourselves, the participants, when you come into the scheme, will all be subject to inspection from the department. Okay? So, um, that's it. It was an overview. It was a quick overview, but if you have any questions, I take them. Thanks, Patricia. Okay. Um, so look, again, remember that uh, we take questions from the floor as well and, and you can enter your questions in, inside as well. So, so look, put up your hands there if you have any questions because look, I suppose there was a lot of interest in Cork West, you know, I suppose tags, we submitted nearly 500 plans uh, of acres and it was a good chunk of them in the CP as well. So look, there was a, you know, it attracted a lot of interest in the area. So any questions on the floor? Yeah. Yeah. Um, what is the bonus who'd get it forced had to work such a good farmer? What's the bonus? You will probably get up to the top rate of, of payment. You won't get the full 10,500. Um, so if you were getting a 10 out of 10, I think there's a little bit of money being held back just um, in case you need to do some training. But you would get nearly up to the full 10,500. Uh, when do you come out to do the um, uh, assessment? When are you coming out to visit the colleges? We'll be out in the colleges, we hope, from June onwards. Yeah. And uh, uh, I know you... We all know you have great foot, footballers, but I never knew you had such good Fanan because down here in West Cork, the bloody Fanan, if we put the cattle on to, to the way they'd come back half dead, if we kept them out too long eating white Fanan here. So you must have a rare breed out above. <laughs> so could we give a bit of a um, uh, thing? What he, what he done? Did they come back with extra weight or had they, when we put them out, they'd lose weight? So just comment on that. Yeah. You raised a very valid point there. The timing of putting the cattle out onto the commonage is critical. The Fanon will only be really in good condition from probably the middle of June onwards, and then you wouldn't want them there any later than August. So the timing, that's what we found in the McGillicuddy Reeks. It had to be there, and it had to be in full growth. Um, otherwise, the, the good goes out of it. Um, the other thing to note then as well is we use native breeds on the commonages. So we use the Dexters, uh, the Drummon or the Dromain, the Kerries. And I don't know if that make a difference or not. I'm not a researcher. I haven't researched myself. But we found that those breeds, I swear to God, lads, the farmers that own those cattle, they were like, what did you do to them? They were huge coming off the mountain. So look, we'll, we'll have a walk around and we won't be long telling you. <laughs> yeah. It could be the breed, lads. I, I genuinely don't know. Um, some, of the, some of our participants on the EIP, on the McGill County Reeks um, EIP, they tried their own cattle and... Uh, I remember going up through the um, Gap of Dunlow one day and I saw four very sad, very, very sad cattle. They were stood beside the road and they were like, what did we do to deserve these? <laughs> they were too good for it. They were too, good to the good, they were too used to the good stuff. Okay. So after a while, they did kind of wander around, but it took a while for them to, to get used to the new accommodation. And if we have the, the cattle to go there, what about the control of the white and the white and the white? Would it, would it, um, yeah, we'd probably have to have a look at it, you know, um, because again, like you could be looking at overgrazing on one species and undergrazing of another. So, like, if the phenomenon is taking over everything else, you would have to look at what you do with it. Okay, we, we, we'll take another question on here before we go to this, to, to Michael. So we've wondered here. So, yeah. so my question is on invasive species. Uh, say most of us in the hill, a lot of hill farmers all have gone into organics, so we can't actually use a uh, uh, we can't use weed killer. So I think that we we need to look for uh, um, what, what to call a derogation. Yeah. I think that, that you know the EIP program should put forward that should, there should be derogation in that instance because that will be an issue as you know yourself. There's lots of money spent at the mo already controlling. Uh, in my own case, and I can confirm also that the cattle will make a difference in the hills anywhere they were. The, the, the improvement in the growth, the regrowth, which is just a hassle and, and problem, an inconvenience of putting them onto poorer ground, but they definitely, the, the ground will absolutely, there's no comparison. You can see a massive return for it. Thanks. So, Mike, have you any questions coming from? Yeah, yeah. So, look at Trish. Uh, there's a good few questions after coming in on the scorecard, okay? Yeah, so, I can I, I, I've kind of um, pulled them together because there was a good few of them. So, one of them is, is will the scorecard be scored more harshly by Department of Agriculture staff than the farm advisors? And then, in the situation where somebody is unhappy with that uh, or unhappy with a score, is there, is there an appeals procedure in place? 
Okay, so no, I suppose the short answer is we will be looking at the scores as well coming in, you know, but I would say to every farmer here, make sure you talk to your advisor as well, you know, and if the advisors themselves, they will get training, but if they're not sure on something, because we will be coming up with guidance documents for these scorecards as well. Um, so there's a huge amount of training that will have to be done on the scorecards, you know, but there'll be de detailed guidance as well on how to apply them. So that shouldn't happen. Okay, and then another one on, on that, I, I, I suppose, if the farmer has private land and commonage land, is it the, the advisor then the, that scores the private land and the CP ski or team then score the commonage land? Exactly, yeah. Okay. And yep. can I, have, I have one okay, more. One more, yeah. yeah. Much okay, and one more then. Um, uh, is there a mechanism in place for measuring carbon sequestration? And if there is, who gets paid for any carbon sequestered? Or well, who owns the carbon credits? Yeah, well, as far as I'm concerned, and <laughs> this isn't official, I think the farmers that own the land should. They're sequestering the carbon, so I think it should be the farmer. But there probably are ways to measure carbon storage. We won't be doing it under the acres. Um, it probably will be something that will be looked at down the road, I imagine, guys. Yeah, but we won't be doing it, unfortunately. I, I, just to comment, I'll jump in there. I suppose like we have the, the signpost uh, program, you know, which, you know, and it's running across the signpost advisory program, which, which was launched in December. So, but as far as the signpost program, uh, where we're looking at, um, we've demonstration farmers on the ground, 120 demonstration farmers across all enterprises across all the country, who are adopting technologies on their farm to reduce emissions on their farm, and it's part of that as well. On a number of these farms. We are um, measuring carbon within the soil. Um, it's a fairly big project we're doing. Um, we have um, fairly expensive equipment on a number of farms. They're called flux towers, where we look at deep carbon storage. And these farms, we will monitor these farms over a period of four, five years so we can see really how farmers are adopting technologies and how that's um, uh, increasing suppose, carbon in the soil. So there, there's a, we are doing a lot of work in that, but in Tagus and that, like, no. Um, and again, we, there's, again, there's work, a lot of work being done in our Johnson Research Centre, which is the main hub, I suppose, in terms of carbon work as well. But like I say, it's been done across all our farms, across the, the industry. So, you know, it'll be, again, we'll see more information coming out of that from, from our farms in, in the future. Um, th I think there's one more question down the back there, and, yeah. and we might wrap it up. Um, that. On a Nutura area and a cooperation area, what's the difference between both of them in terms of the land type. Um, I know there's 7,000 for a Nutura area and it's 10,000 for a cooperation area. Why aren't both of them qualifying for the same amount of land? Are the same amount of money when the um, Nutura area is in a very sensitive um, environmental area? It would be in the Lee Valley. I don't think it's, qua it's uh, qualifying for the 10,000 euro payment. Could you answer that please? I'm afraid you'd have to ask that question to the Department of Agriculture. We did not select the areas. We did not draw the boundaries for the areas for what was going to be in the general or what was going to be in the cooperation. The Department of Agriculture gave us the outline of the areas for the cooperation. So unfortunately, I can't answer that question. As far as I'm aware, what I was told is it was based on uh, high status water bodies. Uh, they were looking at SACs, so special areas of conservation, and they were looking at uh, other things like uh, SPAs special protection areas, so along a lot of the coastal areas. Um, they were some of the areas that they, they, when they selected the cooperation areas, they were the, the, the reasons they selected them. But if you wanted more information, you would have to ask the department. Um, this was in the Lee Valley area, like, and it would, be, it would be touching in the high water quality status, like it's in the River Lee, yeah. and it should be entitled to um, the higher payment. And the farmer in question, he told me that he must keep his stock off of the land for five months of the winter. So that's a huge drawback for him, like. Okay. Yep. And it's all because of the wildlife that's down there and the type of ground that it is. Okay. And uh, he would need a top up, all right. Yep. I would think he would anyway. Thank you. Thank you. So um, th thanks, Patricia, um, for the discussion. So again, if there's any more questions, again, for tonight, Patricia, you'll be here towards the end of the conference again. So thank you, Patricia, for coming to it.